Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Isham, Associate Professor in Guyana Ops Department, Unit 2. And so this is the lecture for the final year students. And the topic is the normal labor. You know, before going to normal labor, I, I want to uh, explain certain landmarks, anatomical landmarks, certain terminologies in front of you so that you may better understand the normal labor. The normal labor uh, we should understand regarding uh, maternal pelvis and also for the fetal skull because this is these are the objects we have to that have to interact for the normal labor among maternal anatomy when we consider the maternal pelvis maternal pelvis actually uh, is false pelvis and the true pelvis here we can see whatever the position area is seen here it is the inlet of the true pelvis and the area above that inlet in between the two iliac bones it is termed as false pelvis and below this line below this red line it is termed as true pelvis true pelvis bounded superiorly by the pelvic inlet downwardly with pelvic outlet and in between, in between that is a pelvic cavity. Pelvic inlet, in most of the cases, the inlet is transversely little bit oval. Right? Here, this is the gynecoid pelvis seen. I'll explain what is the gynecoid pelvis later on in next coming slides. But now you can see this is the type of pelvis in a female pelvis which is little bit more transversely oval as compared to the anterior posterior. This is the diameter of transverse diameter of an inlet that is 13 centimeter and this is the anterior posterior diameter that is the 11 centimeter. And these are the boundaries of the pelvic inlet. And what are these boundaries? Posteriorly, the sacral promontory, right? Then, ala of the sacrum, sacroiliac joint, and this is the ilia terminalis, linear terminalis, that is the whole line up to that. And linear terminalis is again composed of, this is the line, iliopractinal line, that is, here is a certain prominence, that is the iliopractinal eminence, okay? Then, pubic Remi, pubic bone remi, upper border, then pubic tubercle, pubic crest, and the pubic symphysis. This is the upper boundary of the pubic symphysis, right? So again, for repetition, uh, this is the sacral promontory, right? This is the ala of the sacrum, then this is sacroiliac joint. These are the boundaries of the pelvic inlet that is I am mentioning, right? This is the iliopectinal line, there is the iliopectinal eminence, and then the pubic remi upper border, then pubic tubercle, pubic crest, and the upper border of the pubic symphysis. These are the boundaries of the pelvic inlet. Below the pelvic, pelvic inlet, there is a pelvic cavity, and the last limit is the pelvic outlet move forward now the mid pelvis that is the pelvic cavity right we can see this is the sacral promontory and this is pubic symphysis this is the line that is the pelvic inlet plan below is the pelvic cavity right and this is how it is bounded this is bounded by posterior surface of pubic symphysis right on the sides on the both side obturator membrane right of uh, covering the obturator fascia side wall of the pelvis and the sacral bones posteriorly so this the whole space is the pelvic cavity here again we can see this is the pelvic inlet this is the false pelvis above the area and below the area is the true pelvis and true pelvis 
is bounded above by the pelvic inlet and downward by means of pelvic outlet and in between the area inside is the pelvic cavity uh, which is lined uh, from by pubic symphysis posterior surface obturator membrane and the posteriorly the sacral vertebrae then the pelvic outlet Pelvic outlet actually it is a lozenges shaped pelvic uh, outlet. It is bounded. It is an inferior view of the pelvic outlet. This is the lower surface of the pel pubic symphysis. This is the ala of the pubic bone, inferior rami of the pubic bone. Then there is a skull tuberosities. Then from tuberosity, skull tuberosity up to the sacrum, there is a sacrotuberous ligament. Which is lateral posterior lateral boundary of the pelvic outlet and in the tip of the coccyx bone. So this is the outlet boundary, right? What is the pelvic uh, axis? Uh, the axis of the pelvis is the uh, line through which baby has to pass to be delivered through the pelvis. It is a J-shaped imaginary line through which the baby passes, right? This is the pelvic inlet from sacral promontory up to the pubic symphysis. This is the outlet from lower border pubic symphysis up to the coccyx, right? And the, how the baby lies in the standing position, the anterior superior spine and the pubic symphysis lie in the same plane, okay? So how the maternal ab abdomen will be just, uterus will be just like this. This is the plane of the pelvic inlet and the way if we draw the imaginary line to the center of it, <clears throat> the baby has to pass it downward like this. Once the baby enters in the cavity at the level of the ischial spine, the baby has to change its direction because now the direction will be downward and the forward. Initially it was the downward and the backward. Now the downward and the forward. So it is a J-shaped line. It's a J-shaped line through imaginary line through which the baby has to pass. The different types of the pelvic shapes. A woman can have gynecoid pelvis, can have android pelvis, can have anthropoid or the platypoid pelvis. But the most common is the gynecoid pelvis, which is almost round in shape or little bit we can say the transversely oval little bit transversely oval where the transverse diameter is compared to anterior posterior diameter is a little bit more android pelvis which is a heart shaped pelvis anthropoid is the anterior posteriorly oval pelvis platyloid is the transversely oval pelvis right is a flattened type of the pelvis only gynecoid pelvis is very compatible with the normal delivery while in android pelvis there could be uh, obstructed labor in anthropoid there could be the persistent occipital posterior position of the fetus and there could be a prolonged labor and there could be arrested or the obstructed labor in platypoid uh, there will be a trans deep transverse arrest of the fetus once we go through the whole topic of the labor, you can understand these terminologies. So, this was the uh, initially was the overall uh, look of the pelvis. Now, if we have seen, we see the outlet of the gynecoid, android, anthropoid, and pelvis, we can appreciate the gynecoid pelvis is wider in outlet at the pubic arch, and the platelet, platelet pelvis is a platen while the pubic arch is narrow pubic arch is the area under the pubic symphysis and the pubic rami lower border this is termed as pubic arch it is flattened or widened in case of platypoid pelvis it is broader in gynecoid it is narrower in anthropoid and anthroid pelvis now the pelvic floor Actually, the pelvis, pelvic cavity is occupied and filled up by the muscles and the fascias and ligaments. There is no any space through uh, in between the abdominal cavity and uh, pelvic cavity and the perineum. 
only there are few hiatuses that is the opening inside the pelvic floor that is the rectal hiatus we can see here the rectum there is opening of this rectum in the pelvic floor termed as rectal hiatus and anteriorly there is another hiatus that is opening that is urogenital hiatus this pelvic floor separates the abdominal pelvic organs from the perineum perineum the area where the genitals and the anus lies pelvic floor not only supports the pelvic and abdominal organs but also it help in continence of the urinary and the bowel continence pelvic floor comprises of two muscles one is the coccygeus here we can see the coccygeus another is the levator ani muscle from here to here is the levator ani muscle levator ani muscle is composed of certain parts the medial part which arises from the behind the pubic symphysis and crosses the rectum and it slings the rectum it is termed as pubo rectalis then more laterally the pubo coccygeus arising from pubis up to the coccyx then ilio coccygeus arising from ilium to the coccygeus the more most medial part of the pelvic floor which surrounds the vagina they can be termed as pubo vaginalis now the fetal skull fetal skull uh, will be discussed for the skull bones sutures frontally and the diameter overall if we see the skull bone we can appreciate the vault we can appreciate the base and the face there are three parts vault or the cranium we can uh, uh, see certain bones over here certain sutures certain frontal end this is the upper surface superior surface of the cranium vault these are the two parietal bones these are the two frontal bones and this is the occipital bone there are two parietal eminences right and there are two sutures seen here anterior suture frontal and the posterior frontal scene frontal actually are the area where the sutures met and sutures are the spaces between two bones this is the coronal suture which separate or is present between the frontal and the parietal bone frontal suture which separates the two front frontal bone sagittal suture which separate the two parietal bone and the lambdoid suture which separate the occipital bone from the parietal bones anterior frontally is present between the frontal and the parietal bone and between the frontal sagittal and the coronal suture while the posterior frontal is present between the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture posterior is the triangle shaped smaller frontal while the anterior is diamond shaped larger frontal now the diameter of fetal skull transverse diameter of fetal skulls are the biparietal diameter and the bitemporal diameter the widest transverse diameter is the biparietal diameter that is the 9.5 cm we have to discuss Uh, actually we want to discuss regarding the most widest and the most smallest diameter because most widest diameter has to pass the pelvis pelvic cavity and if it is this diameter is capable of passing then all the smaller diameter will be passed so transverse diameter wider is the biparietal diameter between the two parietal eminences then among anterior posterior diameters there are certain diameters we can see here one is the sub occipital this is occipit right this is bregma or the anterior frontal this is the mentum and this is sub mental area that is the in between the mentum and the neck and this is the sub occipital area that is between the occipit and the neck the diameter from sub occipital 
टू ब्रेगमेटिक सब ऑक्सीडो ब्रेगमेटिक इट इज स्मॉलर 9.5 सेंटीमीटर राइट In the same way, the submento bragmatic diameter is also smaller, 9.5 centimeter, and the diameter from the mentum to vertex. Mento vertical is the largest diameter, that is 13.5 centimeter. Another is the occipito frontal diameter, right? The suboccipito bragmatic diameter is seen in vertex presentation. the submento bragmatic diameter is seen in face presentation right so uh, later on we discuss the presentation and eye and the attitude and then we will can understand these diameters over there you know what is normal labor normal labor is the process by which the regular painful uterine contractions bring about the cervical placement there should be regular painful uterine progressive contraction which brings about cervical effacement and dilatation along with descent of presenting part ultimately expulsion of the fetus placenta and the membrane from the mother that is the term this is a normal labor right so before labor again another terminologies that is the lie what is lie lie is the longitudinal relationship of the fetus with that of the longitudinal state of the maternal uterus if the uterus and the baby are parallel to each other this is the longitudinal line if the fetus and the maternal pelvis are perpendicular to each other this is the transverse line if they are oblique then oblique line however should be remember the in longitudinal lie the presentation can be cephalic can be breech what is presentation presentation the part of the fetus which occupies the lower segment it is termed as presentation in lower lie longitudinal if head is downward occupy the lower segment it is termed as the cephalic presentation if the buttex occupies the lower segment it is termed as podalic presentation if there is a transverse lie and the shoulder occupy the lower segment it is termed as the shoulder presentation right in case of the cephalic presentation there are again three more types we can appreciate that all three having the head downward so this is the cephalic presentation but here we can see the head is almost flexed towards spine of the fetus and the diameter is presented here is the vertex here the partially extended head is seen so the diameter is seen here mento vertical so the presentation will be the bro presentation here the diameter is sub mento bragmatic diameter and the presentation is face presentation means in lie longitudinal when the cephalic head is lying down there could be three more presentation either vertex presentation when the head is fully flexed bro presentation when head is partially extended and the face presentation when the head is completely extended then what is attitude attitude is a relationship of the fetal head with fetal spine in term of flexion and extension it could be well flexed head it could be moderately flexed it could be partial extension it could be full extension if there is a full extension the presentation will be face if there is a partial extension the presentation will be bro presentation if there is a fully flexed head the presentation will be vertex presentation then what is denominator denominator is the leading part of the presenting part which presents the position of the fetus mean in which quadrant of the maternal pelvis the fetus lies how the baby lies in the maternal pelvis it can be understand when we understand the denominator denominator is the 
any specific point in the meta, uh, fetal presenting part. For example, this is the kef longitudinal line, cephalic presentation, and presenting part is the vertex. And in vertex, what we choose denominator is the occiput. Then we have to assess where the occiput lies in the maternal pelvis, whether it is the left occipital transverse, whether it is the occipital anterior, whether it is, is the left occipital anterior or the occipital anterior, or whether it is the right occipital anterior or occipital transverse, or right occipital posterior or the left occipital posterior, or direct occipital posterior. The thing is that to show the how the baby lies in the maternal pelvis, we need denominator. In cephalic presentation, we uh, label the occiput as a denominator. In breech presentation, where the fetal presenting part is the buttock, which occupies the lower segment, the sacrum is the denominator. In the same way, in the row presentation, frontal is a denominator. In the facial presentation, the mentum is a denominator. In the shoulder presentation, acromion or scapula is the denominator. Again, the same thing which I have told you, that is where the denominator lies in relation to the maternal pelvis, that is termed as position. Where the denominator lies in maternal, which quadrant it lies. There are the eight quadrants in the maternal pelvis, right? Okay, you can appreciate where the occiput lies. Occiput lies in the right side. So it is right occipital transverse. Here the occiput lies left side. So the left occipital transverse, right? And if the occiput is just under pubic symphysis, it will be termed as direct occipital anterior. If the occiput just lies the posteriorly, it will be termed as the direct occipital posterior. But if the occiput lies in between the right posterior and the right side, it will be termed as right occipital posterior in the same left side, left occipital posterior. If the occiput lies in between the right transverse and the direct occipital anterior, it will term as right occipital anterior and the same left occipital anterior. Again, the same thing. Station. What do you mean by station? The station is used to assist the descent of the baby. Clinically, when we assist the descent of baby, but vaginally, it is termed as station. What we do, we palpate with by PV, we palpate the ischial spine, which is a present in between the inlet and the outlet. In the midway between the inlet and outlet, there is a ischial spine. We initially palpate vaginally ischial spine, then relate it towards fetal skull. If the fetal presenting part is above to the spine, then we will assess how much centimeter it is above the spine. If it is one centimeter above the spine, it will be labeled as minus one station. If it is Two centimeter above the skill point, it is termed as minus two station, and meanwhile minus three and minus four station. In the same way, if the is if we palpate the skill spine and the presenting part is below that skill spine, if one centimeter below, we'll label it as plus one. Two centimeter below, we'll label it plus two, and accordingly plus three and plus four. What are the types of the labor? You know, uh, the term labor means when the baby delivers in between 37 and 42 weeks. But if it delivers less than 37 weeks, it is termed as preterm. If it, if it is delivered after 42 weeks, it is termed as post-term labor. How the labor starts? The physiology of labor depends upon the hormonal factors and mechanical factors. Throughout the normal pregnancy, there is a progesterone predominance, but in the end, the there is a functional progesterone withdrawal and estrogen predominance is seen. 
progesterone function is to stabilize the pregnancy to make the cervix close to make the uterus quiescent so relax but once there is a functional withdrawal of the progesterone estrogen predominance it will increases the contraction associ associated proteins the gap junctions in between the myometrium increases and there is increased signaling in between the myometrium and then there is a start of uterine contraction and this is the prostaglandin which is responsible for the cervical effacement and cervical and cervical dilatation and uterine contraction prostaglandin e1 is responsible for the cervical dilatation effacement and hydration of the collagen tissue and prostaglandin f2 alpha is responsible for the uterine contraction but how ultimately we are releasing the oxytocin which is the main culprit to start the uterine contraction there is a role of mechanical factors as well whenever there is a uterine distension mean pregnancy reaches to term there is a signal giving to the brain that now the uterus is distended to term and there will be start of uterine contraction then another is a stretch of lower uterine segment whenever the baby's head touches the lower segment and cervix there is a ferguson reflex that is stimulating the positive pituitary to release the oxytocin more the fetal head descends more oxytocin releases because it more stretches the lower segment we should understand what is the true labor and what is the false labor whenever there is a true labor on seat there is a regular painful progressive uterine contraction along with cervical dilatation and cervical effacement that is not present in the false labor usually the active labor of uh, active labor in the primary gravida lasts for 10 to 12 hours and multi gravida up to 6 to 8 hours but if it is more if it is more than 12 hours in nali para and more than 8 hours in multi para this can be termed as prolonged labor and precipitated labor that is if the start of labor up to the delivery of the placenta and membrane hall if if happens within 3 hours this is termed as precipitated labor then we'll discuss the stages of the labor there are three stages of the labor first second and third first stage from the onset of the labor up to the cervical dilatation up to 10 cm that is fully dilated cervix second stage from fully dilated cervix up to the delivery of the baby third stage from the delivery of the baby up to the delivery of placenta and the membrane yes the first stage again divided into the two phases latent and the active phase latent phase when the cervical dilatation is seen up to the 5 cm and beyond that 5 cm will label first stage as the active phase in second stage there are two phases again when the fetal head is still high up and there is no urge to push this is termed as passive phase but when the fetal head lies down descends down and there is a urge to push by mother it is termed as active phase of second stage of labor then there is a third stage of the labor third stage of labor we already discussed that is from the delivery of the baby up to the delivery placenta and membrane so uh, this is termed as the third stage of labor that is delivering the placenta you can see the how we are delivering the placenta we are delivering the placenta by means of brand centry method or the controlled cord traction you can see here the uh, a person who is delivering a mother having the left hand over the uterine upper segment this left hand is pushing the segment of the uterus upward and with the help of right hand there is a gentle traction towards the cord so why we are doing this we are doing this because to prevent the uterine inversion if we push the uterus from above downward there will be inversion of the uterus and we want to avoid that initially there was a greets method of delivering the placenta that is pushing the fundus upside down will facilitate the delivery of the placenta but it was a wrong method because it leads to uterine inversion This is a placenta complete picture we are showing here. Okay.
this is the fetal surface and this is the maternal surface. This is a quite smoother and shining one. This is the rough one. We have to examine the both surfaces after delivery of the placenta. And once there, if there's any absence of cotyledon here in the maternal surface, then we can have a suspicious of retained cotyledon inside and then deal accordingly. Now the mechanism of the labor. You know, what is the mechanism of labor? It is a series of changes in position and attitude that the fetus undergoes during its passage through the birth canal. Because baby has to struggle hard, baby has to negotiate the pelvic shape. We all know, we have discussed previously, the pelvic shape at the inlet is different and the outlet is different. So, baby has to negotiate that pelvic shape. First uh, change or event in a mechanism of labor is the engagement. Here we can see the baby enters into the pelvic inlet in a transverse diameter, right? When the bipartal diameter, maximum diameter of the uh, petal head enters the inlet, it is termed as engagement. And abdominally, we are assessing the engagement with the five, fifth method, okay? What we do, we divide the petal head into the five parts. We image, we make an image over. And if the fetal head is delayed or descended up to the one fifth part, this is the inlet, for example, it will be labeled as one fifth descend down and four fifth palpable. If the baby's head is two fifth descend down, then will be said three fifth palpable. If Three fifth descend down, then will be said as two fifth palpable. Once the baby's head is two fifth palpable, when means we can only appreciate the two fifth area of the petal head above the pubic symphysis, then there is engagement. And when it is further descended, only zero fifth palpable, nothing is palpable, then it will be labeled as deeply engaged. Then there is a descent. There are two principles of the labor. Principles mean every part of the fetus has to go undergo that process. One is the descent. Another is the internal rotation. Because every part of the fetus have undergone, should have undergone descent. Right? Otherwise there will be no any labor. When there, there is no any delivery. Baby will be stuck there. Return uh, contraction amniotic fluid and abdominal muscle contractions are responsible for the descent. Then there is a flexion. You can appreciate the baby is entered, engaged in the occipital transverse diameter. Right? This is the occiput, it's occipital transverse diameter. When the baby head enters in the mid pelvis, it touches the pelvic floor. This there is a little bit hindrance, resistance felt by the pelvic, uh, petal head. Then this resistance makes the petal head flex. And why this flexion happen? This flexion happen because to uh, make the more favorable diameter towards lower side. Once the baby head is flexed and this chin completely touches the chest, the suboccipital pragmatic diameter will be seen over the pelvic outlet. And this is the most favorable, most reduced diameter over the maternal or fetal vertex. Then there's an internal rotation. Initially, we see the occiput was transverse. Now, what happens? The second principle of labor is that whatever the part will touches the pelvic floor, pelvic floor will grip it, will grip it and will rotate that presenting part and turn it towards under the pubic symphysis. Initially, the occipital transverse was there, but this is occiput, right? Occipital transverse are there. What happens? Pelvic floor muscle rotate it and make it anterior posteriorly. Now, the occiput is lies under the pubic symphysis, right? So, internal rotation is the rotation from transverse towards the anterior posterior direction. Then after the internal rotation, the baby is just at the level of 
outlet and we will deliver how deliver baby will deliver by means of extension whatever the flexion was seen initially just baby when baby touched the pelvic floor now the fetal head crosses the pelvic floor and once it crosses the pelvic floor it le it is out of the pressure of the pelvic floor now it tries to extend it now the baby head is extending the vulva right there is extension mean another part is the series change in a extension then there is a restitution a restitution actually is a reversal of the internal rotation initially the baby was inside the maternal pelvis and under the pressure of the pelvic floor and that's why it internally rotated but now the baby's head is outside the outlet and there is no any soft tissue over their resistance so baby is free to move whatever the internal rotation was happen inside it will reversed and this is termed as restitution then after restitution what happens this is the time where the shoulders are entered into the mid pelvis in mid pelvis there is a pelvic floor and when the shoulders touches the pelvic floor this is the principle this is the rule whatever the part uh, will touch the pelvic floor will pelvic floor return towards under the pelvic symphysis so and make it towards anterior posterior direction now the shoulder become anterior posterior direction fetal head has to make alignment with the shoulders and it's free to move outside so when the shoulder become anterior posterior the head further moves to make the alignment towards the shoulder and this is seen in case of the external rotation and now this is the whole series initially descent happens in form of the occipital transverse then descend then flexion when touches the pelvic floor and when gripped by pelvic floor this transverse occipital transverse will turn into the occipital anterior and then there's a time to deliver and once baby is outside there's by means of extension there's a restitution which is the reversal of internal rotation and then once there's a restitution the baby's shoulders occupy the mid pelvis and the pelvic floor and pelvic floor mac the shoulders in anterior posterior direction and then a fetal head has to make alignment with the shoulder and it become externally rotated this is the uh, things which we need in the normal delivery but the, uh, but the mo most necessary things are the clamp seen here either there is a disposable clamp or the metallic clamp right there will be a cotton sheets for the baby there should be a caesar either straight caesar or the episiotomy caesar if we need episiotomy cut if caesars are not available the surgical blade on uh, will be okay for cutting the cord right uh, remaining uh, things may be needed if we have to explore the genitalia in form of sims sponge and anything else right how to manage the normal labor labor should be managed by means of labor care guide uh, this is the another topic will be covered by inshallah in next series and thank you